But Fritz Grandi has a list, and I don't know if this was a mistake or he's trying to make a point, but that motherfucking ice cream truck. Hey, making a hit here. Yeah! All I want to know is, are you ready to come back? Working Fans Podcast, cool. Yep. All right, here we go, coming down three, two. Welcome back for another week of the Working Fans Podcast. This is AJ. I'm the former wrestler. We've got Dave, the ultimate fan, here with us. As we do every week, our producer, Joe, may likes to make us sound good and makes us look way more professional than we actually are. As always, you can find us on Twitter. That's at Fans Working. Facebook, Working Fans Pod. We've got email where you can reach out to us and please contact us to let us know what you think of the podcast, and for any ideas that you might have, that's workingfanswrestlingpod at gmail.com. We're on Instagram where you can keep up with us at workingfanswrestling underscore pod. And then you can now listen to us on all major platforms, including anchor.fm, we're on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Apple Podcasts, and you can actually check us out on YouTube. Now, it's important when you go onto the Apple Podcasts and YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a rating, let us know what you think so you can help us out, and we can continue to do what we love and bring you guys in as fans. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely have just been talked to. 19, 1986, uh, Five Season Center in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, there's a WWF house show there. And uh, he was called King Tonga then. Yeah. And I'm there, at 10 years old, I'm a 10 year old kid in the crowd, and if you think about it, this is a top house, 8,000 people in there. And this little kid up in the risers is, is going to be wrestling Haku one day hmm. on a, a television taping in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in front of uh, 20,000 fans at the Target Center. Yeah, that's awesome. There's just nothing. That's just that's just amazing. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Like I find that even just from we've been doing this podcast in September. Maybe it's just like when if you're passionate about the wrestling business. But like when I got to interview like you know certain guys like Al Snow or Ricky Morton. You know, it was like I get goosebumps. I get super excited. It's like oh my god, I've seen this guy live on TV. I don't even know when this is gonna air. But it's funny, we just interviewed George South, who did a lot of enhancement work, obviously. Back yeah. Then. Yep. Uh, we met George. He's a guy, like, I didn't know what to expect going in. I didn't really ever talk to him. But he's so passionate and so excited. He gets you excited talking to him. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm the biggest fan of this guy now. Yeah, I'm probably, probably, probably talking for, like, two hours just talking about stuff. And yeah. how he did things back then. And then just also, yeah, also his stories. It's just, yeah. I mean, you, you, how can you not get goosebumps talking, just hearing his stories? And he's another guy with a lot of passion. I mean, he just lives and breathes professional wrestling, even at this age. Yeah, now, you're obviously very passionate about this because you have another job you do day to day, I believe, and you're still yeah. making this work. Like, I mean, right now, I'm sure it's very hard, but hopefully we'll have some yeah. stuff coming out soon. But, you know, you're still doing what you can just to get the reform. It's got to be just because you love doing it. Yeah, it's, I, I, you know, before this pandemic happened, yeah, it's like I literally am the, the weekend warrior, and it's, I'd be at work all week during the morning, promo ideas, uh, promos, uh, angles, just things just pop into my head all day at work while I try to do my job, and just ideas are coming all day, and it's like now, it's like I'm looking for any inspiration, like something with the Zack Ryder deal, or now with the Talk and Shop, Good Brothers, all that stuff, it's like, God, I feel like a songwriter. It's like all of a sudden, just in the blink of an eye, this promo pops my head, and it's like I have to, uh, I have to film this quick at home. Or like it worked the other day when I, you know, I, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna promote this more right now while the iron's hot. That's the Talk and Shop podcast. I, I just went home and filmed the promo quick, but I, I did a voice test at work just like to make sure, you know, I didn't have a pen and paper to write it down. I didn't feel like doing that. It's like, all right, I'm gonna do this voice text memo right now. And these are those bullet points I want to say right now. And so just, it's just, you get inspired and it's like, if you don't write it down or do something right there, you forget about it and it's gone. Right. Or, or it may not be as good as the original idea that popped in your head. 
No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Like, yeah, I actually uh, I just started listening to that podcast, and I heard you on the other day. And sure enough, I said, I want to get this guy on. He's super exciting. He's fun. And, uh, you know, and I look at it like this, too. Like, you know, like maybe we're a smaller, limited audience, but, like, I want people to know about, hey, look, listen to this guy. Get to know him. You're wrestling fans. Look him up. And I hope that all, you know, like – works out you know what i mean like everybody tries to help each other in the business because it's just i don't know we're still a niche audience as big as wrestling is a niche and i like to think like you gotta all work with each other sometimes you know yeah and and the key thing is with me you know the mtv thing was uh 20 years ago and the exploding trunks of zach Ryder was 10 years ago but yet somehow these little things are remembered and i'm smart enough now to where it's any kind of mention of something happens, I'm going to capitalize on it. It's just, I'm, I'm just taking what the universe is still giving me. The reason I was even interviewed on the Talk of Shop podcast was, I, Carl Anderson made a comment that, you know what, how did he not capitalize that? I don't understand that. Give me an MTV show. Yeah, sure, give me an MTV show now. And uh, make me 10 or 15 years younger. You know, I'll, I'll knock it out of the park and go everywhere. But no, it's just, when I heard that, I felt the need to respond. And that's the thing. I want everyone out there to know. It's always no if you don't ask. Sometimes you're going to get that yes. I've got a lot of no's or no answer, but I got a yes. He replied back immediately. And another example, the Zack Ryder thing. Zack Ryder was interviewed by Chris Jericho for Talk of Jericho four or five years ago. It was, it was like the fifth anniversary of the exploding trunks. Yeah. And after I heard it, and I was just so upset because they were joking and laughing about the most embarrassing thing in my career. And I met I met Chris Jericho once 20 years ago, the night before, not maybe not 20, but close to it, at the NWO sold out was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Five Season Center. Oh, yeah. I got pictures with uh, Eddie Guerrero and his mullet and uh, Chris Jericho. You know, I, you know, maybe I'll send that picture to you, but. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here just doing the Indies in Iowa, nothing really going on, and I was so upset about that podcast, I said, Chris, I understand you're going to be in Des Moines performing with your Fozzie band. May I tell my side of the story of the, the wrestling trunks, of the, of the exploding trunks? And this is a guy with two million followers on Twitter. Yeah. He's known worldwide, he's had this amazing career, and he's, and he's like, absolutely, I would love to have you on the show. I'm thinking... Look at this. I, you know, just that one little, I just asked when I got a yes. And next thing you know, November comes, I, I'm being interviewed by one of my idols on his tour bus, and he's just thrilled to talk to me. Yeah. I mean, how crazy is that? Oh, 100%. And I, I love that attitude. This is about you, but uh, I can connect on that. And um <laughs> I actually, uh, I just recently, uh, I won't, I won't drop his name. And we're still trying to get the interview, but uh, there's a guy. I uh, was, at, cause we've interviewed guys on Ring of Honor, uh, MLW, NWA, and we had a guy. I, I approached about doing an interview at Impact Wrestling. And he said sure, and then he went back to me and said, "Oh, it has to be approved by PR." I was like, "Oh, no problem." And he was nice enough, and he said, "I can get you that PR information if you want." And I said, "Absolutely," but he said, "If you don't want it, I understand." And I said, why the hell would I not want that? I said, of course I want that. I'm like, that would help me out so much. And I told him, I said, I just think there's no harm in asking as long as you ask nicely. Exactly. Yeah. And, and in the, the old way they used to test you, from what I've heard in the old days, in the 80s, the guy back before uh, the cell phones and text message, and the WWF in the 80s, you had to call Pat, uh, oh my God, this is a thing, Dusty Wolf. He was an enhancement guy in the WWF in the 80s. He was, then he was called Dale Wolf yes. when Dustin Rhodes was there. But anyway, he told me how he used to have to call call the office and Pat Patterson kept saying no, no, no. Mm. Maybe, maybe I, I'm, I'm getting my stories mixed up now. But anyway, someone, Pat Patterson kept saying no, no, no. And finally they're like, okay, if I give you a shot, will you stop calling me? He's like, yeah. <laughs> and it worked out. But no, uh, Dusty did hear some no's, but Terry Garvin helped get him in. That was a different story, but he did hear no's before, but, but no, it was no, 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 and then there was a yes. It's just, and that's the thing. Once you get that yes, that is your opportunity. It, it may be a one time, or it could, it could be the start of many, but if, if you nail that one time, you probably do get a chance, 
you know, there's, it's unlimited to what you can do. Have you kept up with NXT at all? To be honest, here and there, I just thought last night, actually, because I haven't watched it yet until then, with the Riddle and Thatcher cage fight. Yeah, that was a really good match, I thought, and to have Angle in the ring with them. I'm just sad that Angle didn't take that position as almost like Riddle's manager. That would have been wild. Yeah. Um, I feel like Angle was really underwhelming in that match. I feel like he was just there because of his name. Because if you notice, Drake Younger was on top of the platform the whole time. I almost feel like he was there to help Angle through it. But then I also feel that it was like one of those scenarios that like when, you know, WWE would have their cage matches on Raw or something, Hemner would be in the ring. And then you had like Kyoto and Tim White outside the cage, you know, yeah. making a shit like if feet touched or what not. Now, did you keep up with any of the Dark Side of the Rings when they were on uh, Vice this year? I watched all of them as they premiered. Oh, wow. I I caught most of them the next day. What did you think of this season? And kind of what did you think of this season versus last season? I feel like the first season was all the stories that people wanted to hear or ones that, you know, everyone's talked about for years. It's just, you know, rumor and innuendo finally coming to fruition through the eyes of Jason, what's his name, Eisner and Evan Huffney. Yes. And then season two was more like, all right, this is like for the real marks, like the real fans that, you know, want to hear about all this stuff that, you know, people have also talked about for years. But, you know, it's for the fans that like really get into like, not to be, you know, ironic here, but like the real dark side of the ring, you know? Yep, because they started off with that Benoit episode, finished with Owen, and then in between you had, I thought, very good personality pieces on New Jack, the Road Warriors. Dino Bravo was interesting. Like, I had heard some of the story before, but to find out, like, kind of the whole thing was even more interesting. Yeah, I will say with that Dino Bravo episode, I cannot believe he put Rick Martel in there with his shoot interview clip that he says that how it all went down. And then afterwards, when I was scrolling through Twitter just to see, you know, the whole world's reaction to the episode, that people were saying, if this episode gets Rick Martel killed, I don't know what the hell will happen. Because I was like, oh, my God, he pretty much, I mean, who knows how much of the truth he told with that little clip they show they showed of him. But I was very surprised to have that in there. Yeah, that's true. And what did you think about, I mean, obviously the Owen was maybe the biggest. I thought Benoit would be the biggest episode when the whole thing rolled out. And then when you finally get to that Owen episode, that was very powerful. And it was, I had never read Martha Hart's book. So to finally hear her side of the story was wild. And then I started reading her book after that. And the book goes so much more in depth into everything that it's one of the better wrestling books that I've read in a while. Yeah, I will say that I do believe that the Benoit episode definitely need to be a two-parter. I also think that the Owen one could also have been a two-parter. But with that being said, the Owen episode was really, really mind-blowing to me because I've always been one of those fans that it's like, oh, Owen's wife's a bitch. She won't let you know, the WWE honor him in the right way. They won't, you know, even Brett even advocated to have Owen enshrined and all that. And I've always been one of those fans that, like, oh, his wife's a bitch. She didn't want nothing to do with the business. But this episode really changed my mind on all that. With the way she went in depth to find out exactly what happened. I mean, even walking the catwalk. And taking her kids there as well, too. Yeah. So they could have a little bit of a closure moment i mean it's kind of a brutal closure moment but if that's really what they needed then you know yeah i mean maybe that's why they came out as well adjusted as they did because she goes into it a lot in her book and with a little more detail so i mean i highly recommend it but the fact that she could have just totally like had a nosedive in her life and she came out of it to be a doctor on top of everything and I mean, 
it, the book really is kind of like the ultimate love story because you hear this lady's wife is, or this lady's husband is taken from her and she really goes to all, to like the best of her abilities to kind of get what really happened out there. Yeah, I mean, I I wasn't really surprised when they talked about it, but at the same time, it was very shocking to hear that when Vince called her to tell her, and he realized that she didn't know, he couldn't even have the balls to tell her that Owen died and he had to transfer the call or whatever or give her the phone number to call the doctor. I mean, that's like textbook Vince McMahon there when tragedy hit. And what's crazy about that is... Yeah, he called her when he realized she didn't know. He hung up. The doctor called her. The doctor tells her over the phone, even though he didn't. It sounded almost like she was just like, just tell me what happened. And the doctor's like, usually we don't do it like this. But and she tells him and then or he tells her and then McMahon doesn't call her for a little bit, but then starts calling her every day after a while to which point in her head she's putting it together that that's just his way or it was what she thought was his way of starting to hedge a lawsuit. And she talks about in the book how after, like at first she didn't want to talk to McMahon and then after a while she's like, you know what? She just starts telling him in brutal detail about like what the kids are going through, what she's going through to kind of try and make him feel something off of what happened and i mean obviously it doesn't paint mcmahon in a good light i mean his i mean i'd say his reputation's taken a hit over the years and it this isn't something you could even come out and defend if if you were him i don't think right i mean even with that too with the jimmy snooker episode it came out about you know vince walked into the police station pretty much left the briefcase there, and then that was the end of that. So, I mean, how much more Vince McMahon are people really going to see that they don't know about or have only heard about that, you know, quote-unquote becomes true now? And I'm honestly surprised that you haven't heard anything, unless he just really doesn't give a shit, that Vince hasn't tried suing, you know, Hussey and Eisner over those couple episodes. Yeah, that's true. Maybe there was just so much truth in it, it's almost hard to dispute. I don't know if you ever heard it, but there was on the post-wrestling podcast feed, Ooh, I want to say it was within the last year, they had an interview with the fan that Owen actually spent his last day with. Because Owen was famous for getting in with fans and they'd pick him up at the airport. You know, they Yeah, I heard Mick Foley would do that too, I heard. Yep. And Post actually interviewed the guy that was hanging out with Owen on his last day. And just, I don't remember exactly what was said, but it gave the sense that Owen wasn't up for the stunt. Like, he wasn't wild about the stunt, but he would do it. And they wanted to practice it a few times, and he just didn't really want to do it. And the tough thing is they don't know if the clip that was used in the practices was the same one that was used during the pay-per-view. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing. The clip was only really supposed to hold like 6 to 10 pounds, I think it was. And as soon as they get yanked on and it just releases, I mean, how is that going to hold, you know, someone over 200 pounds? It's not going to at all. (laughs) No, and they go into how the rigor wasn't the official rigor that worked with Sting. He was like an assistant and... I mean, apparently the guy still works in the stunt industry, which kind of blows my mind, but in a way it doesn't because, I mean, it's the WWE. I can see them using just anybody. Not just anybody, but, I mean, I can see if someone got one over on them, they're like, hey, let's just shut the fuck up about being wrong about this guy. Yeah, I feel like in that field of work that you have to, I mean, I don't feel, I mean, you have to be, 100% 100% on all the time because you're dealing with people's lives if there's a fuck up and obviously you know Owen lost his life because of it yeah and it just it brought back so much because I mean I had known how good Owen was but it has been so long since it happened that you're like god what did we lose 
And then when like you talk, you have Jericho talking about the people that came into WWE just after Owen died and like what kind of career could he have had if we had Owen versus Benoit matches, Owen versus Guerrero. Owen would be like a solid elder statesman now. I could see him maybe even doing like what The Undertaker does coming in once a year. Yeah, I feel like he would have been a very upper mint card guy, maybe even a main eventer. And, you know, he would have, you know, worked with Eddie, like you said, Benoit. And just think about, like, the guys that came after them. You know, like, like him versus Daniel Bryan would have been amazing. But I feel like if he was still alive now, you know, he could have a producer role or, you know, or even just, you know, be at home with his family. Because they made that very clear in the uh, episode that, yeah, he loved the wrestling so much, but he loved his family even more. And it seemed like towards the end, he was just doing wrestling just straight up for money and to support his family. And, you know, almost like he wanted to get out of the business, but Vince was keeping him there, Well, that's, you know, for the money. That's one thing that Martha mentions in her book is that he wanted to get a regular job. I for, I wish I could remember the job he applied for now. I want to say it was the fire department. Yeah, I've always heard that, that he wanted to be a firefighter instead of wrestling. Yeah, because one of his fire. brothers was a firefighter. But it was one of those things that it's the family business. He's just so gifted at it that even though he wanted to get out, he still came back to it because it almost came too easy for him. Well, yeah, when you got the whole family into it, you know, I mean... If anything, he was the prodigy of the whole family. You know, Brett had the most successful career, but with Owen on the come up when, you know, Brett, you know, tagged him in with Neidhart in the 80s. And, you know, Brett became a man adventure. And, you know, after that, pretty much the whole WCW story with him. You know, it's hard to not think about what Owen really could have been if he wasn't misbooked, you know? Yeah. And it was cool to see that that Dark Side of the Ring shirt that they released uh, through Pro Wrestling Tees became, like, the second most popular shirt on the site in five days. And every th- all the proceeds, or a certain amount of the proceeds, go to the Owen Hart Foundation, which his wife started because she wanted to kind of represent the other interests in Owen's life and kind of have his name carry on not because of what he did in wrestling, but because of the kind of person he was. And when you hear that part of the book slash show, I think that's where a lot of people's minds possibly turned around on Martha. And it almost makes me look at Mark Henry weird now that he would say, like, you owe it to your son for Owen to go in. Like, obviously, a lot of people would like to see Owen uh, honored. But... It's it's kind of like, what does his wife want? How is the best way she wants to represent him? Because, I mean, it, she lost him, and it wasn't even her choice, really. She definitely wants him represented for the person he really was, which was a kind, caring man, a family man. But at the same time, when he's most recognized for being a wrestler, it's very tough to... Uh, you know, draw the line where, all right, you know, he has to, he have this whole foundation in his name dedicated to people across the world to help them. But then again, you know, he's one of the most renowned wrestling superstars ever. All right, everybody, welcome back for another week of the 531. We are actually recording. If you want to get a hold of us, give us your list, give us your comments. You can find us on Gmail at theworkingfans at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Dave and AJ Working Fans Wrestling page, on Twitter at Fans Working. I just fucking bumbled that whole intro. But Dave, how are you doing this week? I was in wrestling. I'm like, yeah, you shouldn't on this. So anyway, <laughs> I'm doing good. Look, this is like the third 531 in a row we're recording today. Fucking hot. You know, we're bumbling shit. We're forgetting. We're still working on new equipment. But guys, we're here working for you. And if you don't like it, 
I we're face to face. We're risking our lives for your entertainment. So if you want to talk some shit, I mean, go find AJ. He's training. He's ready to take you on. Hey, the cat's over here looking at me. Yeah, the cat is just done. He's on the floor. He's like, it's too hot. Turn on the fan. But Thor, you know, Thor, we can't turn on the fucking fan. You'll hear it on the mics. This cat just walked out of here like he doesn't give a fuck about me. So the thing that we do give a fuck about is the top five wrestling cities. Now we got Scott from Voluntown gave us a list. He's got Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Toronto, and Tokyo. Chicago, Chicago, that happened in town, that happened in town. I'm a little Sammy Davis Jr., I think. I don't know. For the Rat Pack. Chicago, that's going to come up on a lot of lists. New York, Philadelphia, obviously. Toronto, like I, I was saying earlier when this didn't record, not a town I necessarily would have thought of. But, I mean, you think about all the big... And I was mentioning during that that Edge and Cena had a wild match on there. The crowd was crazy for You were talking about TakeOver yep. where DIY wrestled uh, the Revival. Also, I believe that's the one where Bret Hart had probably his finest moment in WCW where Goldberg speared him. And it turned out Brett was wearing like the protective metal armor shield and Goldberg knocked him. There's an ice cream truck. I think the neighbors are out there getting ice cream. So if you hear a little ding dong in the back, that's what the fuck is going on. The cat is perturbed. Thor is back in here. He is not feeling it. I'm not getting you an almond crunch bar. Speaking of little ding dong, what's on Randy's list this week? <laughs> Jesus. Randy had Chicago, New York, Charlotte. Woo! Philly in Atlanta. Jake brought us a list, and he's also got another pick that's outside of, you know, what I'd expect for the regular. He had Chicago, yep. Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Boston, and Tokyo. Actually, Randy mentioned Brooklyn as a bonus on there, too. Yeah, Randy had Brooklyn as a bonus, and that was interesting because Jake had it on his main list. And that's a town that, what, probably would have only popped off in the last, like, five years, maybe I, when... I, maybe the takeovers, when, what I think about, too. Takeover? Yeah. Fantastic. Shard Johnson from the Rock and Randy's Rock and Wrestling Group had Chicago, Greensboro, Atlanta, Tampa, and New York. I am the man who will fight for your honor. All right, anyway, yeah, Chicago. Chris Zauha, always gonna be Zaucha, bud. I'm gonna say it every time. From Rock and Randy's Rock and Wrestling Group had Chicago, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and Toronto. Josh Dunn from Rock and Randy's Rock and Wrestling Group, friend of the show, former guest, had Worcester, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, Tampa, Chicago, and Voorhees, New Jersey. Is Josh Dunn the interview that we fucked up on on iTunes and we cut it off partly halfway through? I don't know if it ever got fixed. <laughs> That's a good question. You I'm just. What? It might have been an interview, but it might be the episode. It, I think it was the five three one. There might have been an issue with Josh Dunn just making a reemergence on social media lately, and we don't talk about it nearly enough. I mean, it, this is weeks ago now when you're hearing this, but he was off the Rock and Randy's Rock and Wrestling Group for a while, and the amount of joy that people showed when Josh came back, it had to have felt good, and it shows you those little things like Chris Zauha on Facebook and social media. It might just be like a two minute quick thing that they put on Facebook but the joy that it provides people and just the laughs people get from both of them I mean Josh is inspirational too but it's good to see him back we just wanted to say welcome back Josh Dunn but I'm not here I'm watching the hell of a match with Donovan Dijak and Joe Janelle and I'm thinking on that list we had we were hiring AW people up how is Dijak not on the list? This is, we are actually in the background right now. We've got Beyond Wrestling's Looking California on the DVD player, and Janello versus Dijak is putting on a hell of a match right now. This event actually started off with David Starr versus Jay Freddy. I, it was already going on. Like yeah, very hard hitting Matt. I'm only thinking about it now because it's flipped over. Two and former guests. Two former guests, God. We've had, I mean, we're not to a year oh, yet. Two to our own horn. Toot, toot, as the great out here, so it's, uh, We will definitely, I assume, do a one-year anniversary episode when we do it, but I'm really amazed at the people we've got. When you look back at the former guests we've had and be like, wow, we've talked to... We have not, we have not done a repeat guest yet either, and I'm thinking about doing it at some point. God, we who is it? Jay Freddy was almost our first repeat guest yeah, when he yeah, took that yeah. nasty fall. Wow, well, stuff has happened because of like the COVID thing. Yeah, we almost had Al Snow as a repeat guest, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, for first year podcast, I think we've been doing good. What was when you talked to JoJo, the producer, 
back before we were starting the podcast. What was that thing he said about wrestling podcast? Let's take a look here real quick. We can look this up, actually. Simple enough. I know he said a lot of them won't last. People just give up, so hang in there. And I mean, to be honest, at times, it almost feels like we're speaking out into the bleakness of the universe. Never and pay, never pay a guess that sets a bad president. So he said September 29th, he said, by this time of year, I bet one-third of all wrestling-related podcasts are gone. The money being, the money is being spread too thin. Now, we and ain't making true. no money off this club, motherfucker, but it's a blast. I love doing this. I want to keep doing this. Yeah, it's almost like a hobby that's expanded just outside of a hobby, but not yet to a business. because. And, and don't get me wrong, that's the goal at some point, is to like, hopefully get this thing popping off and just see where it goes. But right yeah. now, we're learning our trade. We're trying to constantly improve. And yeah. we're looking at different avenues. And we're trying to make connections out there with people, too. And we're just seeing where it goes. Yeah, because if you're getting into podcasting for the money, you really got to have a name going into it. And even then, you still got to hustle. Right now, we're just talking wrestling probably like we would be if we weren't recording. Yeah. But we're also getting to talk to wrestlers. We're getting to... I don't know. I think in some way add to the culture. I don't know if it was going to be last week by the time this airs, but what George South interview I did recently, like when I talked to George, he is just so excitable. He's super like just happy to be doing this. And I'm on the other end. I'm by myself. I'm doing this interview. And I'm marking out. Now I'm getting fucking excited. And there's nothing that like really beats that for me. Like when I'm talking to these guys that I grew up watching. Would you say it's Bobby Blaze level? Like the interaction we had with Bobby? Yeah, but a bigger, and this is not Bob, Bob is tremendous, I don't but George has an enthusiasm. Uh, and, and George, Joe has not listened to this. Interview. I haven't heard it yet. Yeah, no. so like, we're going to basically edit that out. Yeah. But the enthusiasm that George has is just it's, uh, tremendous. It, it made him one of my favorite interviews, actually. We've definitely had a couple interviews that have been less than enthusiastic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't name names, but there's a couple guys. Uh, there's a couple. You know, you got some good quotes, though. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to say his name, but he's off the hook now. Yeah, <laughs> let me tell you. When he's in the territory, it's territory, too. Oh, God, yeah. It, it ain't a territory unless he showed up. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now that we've gone a little off the list, I mean, I, I it's good to... Yeah, it, I mean, we cut... We had, like, a 6 o'clock time that we were going to end on, and yeah, we've blown sense. by that. But, I mean, that's how much fun we have when we actually sit around and start doing this. It's like, oh, shit. This is why we podcast, for the conversation, for the fun. I've never looked at it as necessarily a way to get ourselves over or to get ourselves a job. That's Aside from Court Bauer. Court Bauer, if you want to hire us, we got an MLW oh, review coming right your now. way. Me and Joe have never looked at this as a way to get ourselves over. By the way, shout out to AJ, who's not here with us. We all win at the end of the day. We're all the Working Fans podcast. Oh, yeah, we're all Working Fans. fans. Oh, damn right. Let's go to the top five wrestling cities. Yeah, we'll do AJ's list. His top city is Chicago. Montreal is number two. Atlanta's number three. The hotbed of Rochester, New York is number four. And Cleveland is number five. I've been to Cleveland for a pay-per-view. I saw Money in the Bank there, actually. That was actually a big trip because that was my first trip after finally being done graduating college five years ago it took a little while but my brother got tickets to the money in the bank 2015 show i want to say i want to say that was ambrose ambrose is on the anniversary seat that i have downstairs i want to say it's 2015 also nxt was just kind of touring around that time they actually had come through columbus no it was in columbus that Money in the Bank was because NXT was in the same city and then we went to Cleveland for Raw the next night. Mm-hmm. What was your favorite show? And it wasn't Raw, was it? Raw wasn't bad. Money in the Bank, we were front row. That's the first time I've ever been front <laughs> Yeah, if you watch the pay-per-view, if you're watching the front row, we are all the way at the end of the screen on the right. We were on the corner of the barrier, so you'll see us from time to time in that show, but that was a real good time. NXT, they still hadn't fully popped off yet. They were still, they were just starting to do those weekend tours. So I want to say that Alexa Bliss was still with the tag team she was with. I want to say Blake and Murphy. Back when that was going on, I can't, 
I'm trying to remember all the people because NXT was at such a different spot at that time. I want to say that Samoa Joe had just come in the company. I want to say it was a triple threat match in the main event. Either way, it was amazing. But Fritz Grandi has a list, and I don't know if this was a mistake or he's trying to make a point. With that motherfucking ice cream truck. God damn, we're recording here. We're trying to be professionals. And this goddamn ice cream truck is making money off the kids in the Jewett City area. Back to Fritz Grandi's list because fuck ice cream. Number one and two on his list are Greensboro, North Carolina. I don't know if that's to make a point or he just flubbed it, but that once again is making me mad that I left Greensboro off the list. I mean, that's Flair race, I just think about, especially Flair. Yep. Memphis was his number three. Couldn't believe I didn't put it on when you think about how hot Southern wrestling is in that area. I saw how you interpreted this list. Like, me and Scott were talking about this a lot. Like, well, he's got more lists, more city. Okay. He's got Chicago and New York to round out his list. Okay. And, like, I, want, I just want to say this. Like, you know, like, for me, when I get to my list later, it's basically rapid crowd. I was looking for noise. But, like, then you wouldn't really probably put Tokyo on there. But Tokyo is such a historic wrestling city. That you can see why people include. I would argue they have a different type of noise because they more have the watch. Like, they're quiet, they watch. And then when something pops them, I believe MVP has talked about it and a couple other wrestlers, how there's a slow, like, oh, that you get almost a different kind of reaction. But when you get that reaction, it's notable. Yeah, speaking of historic cities, I don't think it's made the list. I don't know if they will. Mexico City. Goddamn, no, Mexico City hasn't. Even, I mean, shit, Tijuana at this point, between what the crash has done there, multiple promotions, yeah. Once again, it's a lot of where you thought of, where you think about it. I'm sure if we had maybe a couple more Latin American listeners, it would have popped up more on their list. There's an old way to make that, Minneapolis. I don't know if Minneapolis will make some people's list, but... Nah, I made nobody's, sadly. Or maybe it made a list that I fucked up on. Who knows? Mike Flynn's got a list for us. He's got Philadelphia, Toronto, Tokyo, Charlotte, and London. London, it's a surprising pick, but I like seeing that different people have these different world cities that catch them. I think sometimes these foreign crowds pop off because you see, like, WWE won't go there very often. Right. Then the one TV they have from there, people are losing their fucking minds. And they don't get to go to a live crowd all the time. It's awesome for them. True. Now, we already covered Randy's list. We got AJ's list. Zach had Toronto, New York City, Philly, Chicago, and Tokyo. Yeah, solid list. Jesse from New Hampshire, can't leave him out, had NYC, Chicago, Atlanta, Philly, and Tokyo. Dave, there's one person we don't have lists left, a uh, list from. That's from you. Joe, did you put your list there? Shit. Did I even read my list? I don't even know. Well, let's go with my list. because No, we definitely didn't read my list because I've got Chicago, Tokyo, New York, Providence, Rhode Island, and Boston. Providence, just because, I mean, a lot of the Beyond Wrestling I've seen has been from Providence. And I think what Beyond has done between Worcester, Mass, and Providence, making a bit of a name for the city, I think. A couple Royal Rumbles in there, too. That is the one where they killed off Undertaker and he rose to the heavens. Yep, a couple of Rumbles. I believe my buddy Jesse, not Jesse from New Hampshire, he went with his sister and I want to say his stepbrother. Yeah. To, the 40-man Rumble? I believe so. We'll yeah. have to... <clears throat> he watches us on YouTube. Thing. Not a wrestling fan, <laughs> but he's definitely been to it. Okay, so it's my time then, huh? It's your time. It's your time. It's your time. My time's up. My time's now. All right. Number one <laughs> on my list. I had to mention this city plenty of times in other episodes. Jewel City, right? <laughs> For that pop in an EW show where the winner of the main event was going to rename the town the, the fucking Youth Center. Sounds... A little <laughs> surprise. Youth Center name didn't change. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fuck you, city. <laughs> Chicago is my number one city. I mentioned that before in my Gary Capetta interview, how I always love Chicago. I think you've mentioned multiple times how Chicago is a hot crowd because never obviously been. they've been a hot crowd through time. I think we mentioned it with Zalpa too. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, we did. Also, Calgary is number two on my list. 
Go watch the Calgary Stampede in your house event and watch the reaction for the Hearts versus, I want to say it's LOD, Gold Dust, Ken Shamrock, Steve Austin, and is that five? Gold Dust, Ken Shamrock, I LOD, Steve Austin. Austin. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. I was just thinking because I wanted to mention that if anybody hasn't read, read Martha Hart's book, I believe it's called Broken Hearts. Mm. It is. I'm halfway through. I don't know if I'm halfway through it. I'm actually about to start the chapter about Owen's death. Yeah. Or no, Owen's funeral. Okay. It, she goes into heavy detail about the whole time. It's a very good book. Mm. And if you look at modern Jerry McDivitt comments where she wasn't involved or didn't seem involved in the investigation, I think he was trying to insi- Or I believe I heard he was insinuating. Mm. This book shows totally different. But it also gives you a good idea of how important the hearts are in Canada. Yeah. So to see the hearts wrestle in Calgary, I've got to go back and watch that in your house. It's got to oh, be out of hand. It's, it's tremendous. So who do you have after Calgary? I got New York slash Brooklyn. Because at the end of the day, New York is the more historic city. But I think Brooklyn uh, is maybe the one that's... Uh, bringing more enthusiastic rapid crowd these days yeah and you kind of want to the way that I hear connecting New York City and Brooklyn you're not necessarily taking anything away from them Mm -hmm. but it's almost like New York City was classically that go to place and in recent years Brooklyn has made itself more it kind of it's made itself a destination as well number four on my list let's see if it surprised you in the beginning but I think it's getting over now Toronto I love those Canadian crowds. And number five, talking about rabid crowds, how do I not include Philadelphia, home of the ECW movement? That is a good point. Now that we're getting down to a top three list, Chicago. Oh, Chicago's on the list. New York. Yeah. Who goes in that third spot? It's going to be tough. Philly's made a lot of lists. Toronto's made a lot of lists. Calgary. Calgary's made a couple. Uh, Greensboro. I heard people mention Atlanta. Atlanta. Charlotte, too. Charlotte. Is there anyone that's really sticking out there that uh, got a lot more votes than the other? Toronto, Tokyo. It's, it's like Toronto, Tokyo, Atlanta. Okay. So, all right. So, Chicago's in. Let's talk about Chicago, Toronto, New York, Atlanta. I say, are just easy ins. I, I'm gonna do. Okay. I'm gonna one. do New York. I'm gonna do New York slash Brooklyn. Okay. Because when you bring that up. It just feels like a good one to include. Okay. I feel like Brooklyn's in the city of New York. Is it a borough of New York? Brooklyn, Bronx, the Queens, and Staten. From the Battery to the top of Manhattan. I, that, that's a rhyme from somebody, and that's how I remember the boroughs in New York. I'm sorry. No sleep till Brooklyn. All right. No sleep till Brooklyn, exactly. I'm, We're going to call it part of the city. If you're from the city and you dispute that. So we got Brooklyn and Chicago right Fans now. working, working fans, wrestling podcast at gmail.com. Fill it up. We got Brooklyn and Chicago right now. So. Chicago and New York and Brooklyn are definite ends. Okay, then I want to say. So it's like Philly, Toronto. Let's throw Toronto. Go Toronto. Have a Canadian crowd in there. Because I feel like Philly's a good crowd, but yeah. I mean that New York Brooklyn crowd's almost equivalent. Mm-hmm. I mean Philly has more of the ECW fan base, so oh, yeah. you it's almost want to say like a more rabid crowd, but put anybody in front of a New York crowd yeah. and it could go wild. Yeah. I feel like it's Canadian uh, brothers, and I think you'd be acknowledged. <laughs> exactly. We can't leave Canada out. Yeah, we leave Canada No out. matter what AJ says about him. Uh, he's wrong. But and, I mean, if you guys have been keeping the score, you, you guys know what Dave says about Canada, right? <laughs> Toronto, Brooklyn slash New York. We got to choose a third town because we're hungry. Dave's got a UFC event to go to. Probably heard this in the last episode, too. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's what we thought we were going to How many UFCs this motherfucker go to? <laughs> Listen, guys, we're the Working Fans Podcast. Mm. Wish I could say the name of my own fucking show. How many times have I busted you guys on fucking up the name of the podcast? Oh. Dave, who who we drop it first? Chicago, New York, Brooklyn, or Toronto? Well, so I want to get my Canadian brothers in there. They don't have the same historic significance of uh, New York and Chicago. Yeah, it's tough. Like, we want to include Toronto in there because they've had such good crowds, but... Actually, I want to put Calgary in. But so many people voted for Toronto. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, and Toronto's probably had more of the bigger televised things from yeah. that. But that stampede in your house is still so legendary for a crowd. Yeah, that's such a high watermark. Yeah. 
And probably, who knows, even Stampede Wrestling probably did good in its early run with the crowd, with the audience that it had. The audience wants Chicago. Chicago is the town. They are absolutely bananas for WWE events, AEW events, old-time WCW events. You just look at ruckus crowds, you're going to see a picture of Chicago. And isn't it wild that Chicago would win top city on our list, which it's it's already won. We're not even going to debate no, this. No but when you consider that New York has Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena, that should mean something. Mm. But you've heard multiple wrestlers put over when it was the Rosemont Horizon. Oh, yeah. It's been the Fleet Center. Nationals. Stone Cold's talked about that particular... Nationals. Have you been to Chicago? I have not been to Chicago. I've never been to Chicago either. Alright, I don't think AJ's been. Why Chicago on this? Because they bring it that much. There's people who've never even been to Chicago. We're seeing the reaction. True, and like when we had Zaha on that yeah. traveled to Chicago, puts over the crowds. AEW chose it to host like, yeah. the all in, the all out events. Yeah, all out was, yeah. It's going to be what? Their Labor, Labor Day town? Pretty Labor Day is at the end of the. Every day, the all in event is pretty much Chicago. Yep, and that's going to be the end of summer event. Whereas Double or Nothing's Vegas, and that's Memorial. I always fuck up Memorial Day and Labor Day, so I got to remember which one starts. I mean, we don't summer. know what's going on right now because that now everything's just in Florida, and maybe Georgia soon. But things could change, and we'll get back to normal. True, but yeah, they they the kind of anchored it there. So Chicago's the top wrestling town. Yeah, no, no. It's close as bad boy up. And I mean, guys, you know what the music means. That means we're done for another week of the 531. As always, find us on our email, workingfanswrestlingpod at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at fansworking. We're on Instagram, wrestling, working fans wrestling underscore pod. You got Dave and AJ on Facebook. You got Working Fans Wrestling Pod on Facebook. We're on YouTube. If you're a real life person that listens to this and you're not subscribed to our YouTube, help a brother out. We're battling some bots here. And as always, we just want to thank you guys for listening and we'll see you next week. All right, so that wraps us up for this week. Thank you again for listening to the Working Fans Podcast. So as always, you can find us on Twitter at Fans Working. Our Facebook page is Working Fans Wrestling Pod. We have email where you can reach out to us and let us know what you think also. That's Working Fans Wrestling Pod at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram, Working Fans Wrestling underscore pod. And then as always, please continue to listen to us on Anchor.fm, Google Podcast, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, all your major platforms. If you're following us on Apple Podcasts, which we are also on now, and YouTube, please make sure you subscribe and give us a five-star rating. It helps us bring you these podcasts where we get to talk to you and talk with you every week.